My good man. Yes, you. You tell us where we might find the king of the Jews? King of the Jews? What do you speak of? We have seen his star in the east and it's rising. We've come to worship him. And we've come a long way. King of the Jews. Your Majesty, there are some foreigners here. They say they've come from a long way. They say they're in search of the king of the Jews. What king of the Jews? You ever heard of such a prophecy of one to come? Your Majesty, I don't feel you need to be concerned. The prophecies, my Lord, are like seeds scattered throughout history. I really believe, Your Majesty, you can rest your mind. That's a loose paraphrase from the greatest story ever told, 1965, when they came to Herod, of course. Now, what we're going to do is find those seeds tonight, a rapid survey of the Old Testament to look for the prophecies of the king. Now, there are three principles when you look for the prophecies about the king. Number one, there are many words in the Old Testament text that are synonymous or equivalent to king, ruler, governor, shepherd, dominion, kingship, scepter, star. So when you see these words, they also represent kings, not only in the biblical passages, but also in ancient Near Eastern literature. It was very, very well known. Number two, the men who were carried by the Holy Spirit when they wrote the prophecies didn't really understand all that they were writing. First Peter chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. It says they diligently inquired and pursued and analyzed and tried to understand who the Spirit of Christ within them was telling them about. So they didn't have full understanding. It is easy for us on the other side to look at them and say, hey, why didn't you guys get it? No, they were seeing through a glass darkly. But the seeds are everywhere. And so we're going to do that. The third principle is called the mountain peak principle. When you go to look at the text looking for the king, you have to understand the mountain peak principle. What does that mean, Michael? The prophecy about the Messiah to come is always first in the er era that it was given. It's talking about a present Davidic king, but there's always, there are always elements in the prophecy that could not apply to a human king. It's talking about the great Davidic king to come. You must understand that when you go to these texts. Let's go. We're going to go to the first text. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, given by Balaam. Now, Balaam was actually a pagan diviner. He was a Moabite. And he was a very evil man, believe it or not. In fact, the Lord slew him, had Israel slay him, believe it or not, after he gave this amazing prophecy about the Messiah. Wait a minute, Michael, God can't do that. He can't use an evil man who the Bible says in Jude and in Second Peter that all he was driven by was by greed. And yet, wait a minute, Remember what happened at Jesus' crucifixion? His arch enemy, Caiaphas the high priest, who was one of the major key figures on the human side to orchestrate the crucifixion of the Son of God. Remember he, what he told the rest of the Sanhedrin? You know nothing! Don't you know that it's better for one man to die for the nation than the whole nation perish? John 11:52. And what does the text say? He did not say this on his own. But as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. You know what I think that's awesome about, beloved? Is right in the middle of the most heinous, evil, vile, wicked event, the crucifixion of the Son of God, nothing comes close, all combined in human history, and God's right in the middle of it. He uses the high priest who hated his son's guts, and he prophesied through him. So yes, God used Balaam, and this is what Balaam said. Lo, I see him. But not now. Behold, I behold him. But he's not near at hand. This is what he said. A star shall come forth out of Jacob. Again, remember, the star in both biblical literature and extra biblical literature stood for a king. Now watch. How do we find out about this majestic king to come? We've already found something out from Balaam. He said, a star shall come forth out of Jacob. A king is coming, and now we already learned a little bit about him. Jacob, of course, was the grandson of Abraham, the father of the faith. One thing we know, he's a male, he's a king, and he's a Jew. And then he goes, and the scepter will rise out of Israel. Now, speaking of Jacob, let's go back to Genesis 49.10. Jacob is prophesying over his sons, and he gets to Judah. 
What does he say about Judah? He says, the scepter, and there it is again, another, it's synonymous with king. The scepter will not depart from Judah. So we know he's a Jew, we know he's a man, we know he's a king, we know he's, a, he, he's from Israel, of course. And now we find out from Genesis 49.10, he's from the tribe of Judah. And it says that the scepter, in other words, this kingship, will not depart from Judah. Nor will the ruler's staff, there it is again, ruler, won't depart from between his feet. It's a euphemism talking about his descendants. This king that is to come will be Jewish forever. And watch now, until he who, to whom it belongs comes. The messianic kingship is going to be in Judah, the tribe of Judah, until the one to whom it belong comes. So we found out so much already now. We know all those factors from these little seeds scattered throughout history. Now watch this. Then we go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, a very, very key messianic text. And the Lord is speaking to David, and he tells them basically, I'm going to raise up someone from your loins who will follow you and succeed you after you die. And of course, we know who he's talking about. Solomon. And he goes, he will build my house. And Solomon did. Of course, he built the temple. And so... Now we know, we, we know about this, but he says his dynasty will never end. So now we have all these facts about this coming messianic king, but now we know that his dominion and his authority are never going to end. Now, then it says, I will become his father and he will become my son. Well, that's a very common expression as far as it's called adoption language. The, the king in those days, was, it, it, was, it was sonship. So it's very common, but watch this. It says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. But let's go to the book of Hebrews. The Holy Spirit through the book of Hebrews, centuries later, is talking about Jesus. To which of the angels of God ever say, I will be his father and he will be my son? So we knew that could not be Solomon, only adopted son. He's not the inherent son, the equal in father and the spirit in the Trinity. Now, I'm, I'm going to skip because I want to get so many of these, these little seeds and then, then, then the Lord tells David, your house and your kingdom will stand before me permanently. Your dynasty will be permanent. But wait a minute. Hundreds of years later in 586, 587 BC, the Bab Babylonians totally destroyed the palace and much, much worse, they destroyed the temple. And there was nothing left sent by Nebuchadnezzar. So wait a minute, does it look like the word of the Lord failed? God forbid. But look at Israel has not had a king for over 2,500 years. But watch, can God's word fail? No, of course not. So what happened? All of a sudden, this angel Gabriel, the same one who appeared to Daniel centuries before, all of a sudden shows up in the hill country of Galilee and Nazareth and comes to Mary. And what does he say? He's talking about Jesus. He will be great and we will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. So the Davidic line is continuing. But of course, the Messiah, the second mountain peak, is the one who fulfills it. Now... Then it says, let's go to the Psalms now. Psalm 2-7, a very, it's called a royal psalm, a messianic psalm. And it says, I'm, this is God the Father speaking, I myself, in the Hebrew it's emphatic, I myself have installed my king on Zion, my holy, my holy hill. And the Lord said to me, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. And the, actually, that's talking about the coronation of the Davidic king. But here again, we go back to Hebrews, and although David was the first mountain peak in that text, there was a greater king who was to come. And what does it say? And the same thing in Hebrews, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. It says, to which of the angels did God ever say that to? And the author of Hebrews is comparing the supremacy of Jesus to the angels. And angels are absolutely terrifying and glorious and splendor. Where even the apostle John, after seeing the glorified, resurrected Jesus Christ twice in Revelation, after seeing that, he still went to worship an angel. And what did the Lord say though? To which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Angels are never referred to in the singular as sons, only in the plural. This is talking about the unique son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we get to Psalm chapter 45, and this is a glorious royal psalm. Somebody in the Davidic king's court in the palace, they were so overwhelmed, beloved, by the, by the regal grandeur and splendor of the Davidic king in his robes and, and you know, the, the glory of, of it. All he could say was, and one of the things that he exclaimed was, your throne, O God! is forever and ever. Now we all know that the Jews, and rightly so, were fiercely monotheistic. They knew that this was royal hyperbole is what it's called. It was just 
an overflow bursting forth because of seeing the glory of the earthly king. But watch this. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, again, Hebrews chapter 1, it's really God the Father speaking of Jesus, the eternal king. And watch this. God the Father says to him, Thy throne, O God. God the Father is calling the eternal Son God as well. Woe to those who deny his deity. You'll be dealing with the Father. You want to make God the Father furious? Deny the glory of his Son. God the Father himself speaks directly to the Lord Jesus. Your throne, King, O God, is forever and ever. And a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. Next one, next one, Psalm 110. Of all the Old Testament texts that are quoted in the New Testament, what, this is the one that's quoted the most. And what does it say? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Of course, as we learned from the New Testament, David wrote that and said that. But of course, we know that David died and even Peter in his sermon in, at, at Acts chapter 2 and at Pentecost, he said David's remains, he decayed. He's not the one this is talking about. And who's it talking about? It's talking about God the Father addressing the Lord Jesus. What does he say? The Lord said to my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, when did this happen? What about Daniel? One of the most glorious visions of the Son of Man, which was one of Jesus' personal preference. He preferred this title for himself, the Son of Man. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel goes, I was watching in the night visions, and all of a sudden, sudden I saw one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And it says he was brought before the Ancient of Days. God the Father. This is what happened, beloved, after he was crucified, resurrected, and ascended. What happened when he entered back into heaven? This is what it says. He was approaching up to the Ancient of Days and was, was as, escorted before him. To him was giving ruling authority, honor, and sovereignty. Now, I've I got to keep moving, but let's go to the prophets. Isaiah chapter 6, all of you know it well. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. You all know that passage. It's one of the most glorious ones, but watch. And then what did I say, Isaiah do when he saw the, the, the Lord? He said, ah, I'm undone, I'm destroyed. Why, Isaiah? For my eyes have seen the king. We know from John chapter 12, verse 41, John wrote, writes centuries later, it says that Isaiah saw Jesus and spoke about him. It was the Lord Jesus on the throne in that glorious vision of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And watch now, before he, they even name the child, what's the first thing they say, beloved? And the government shall be on his shoulders. So it's like the ruling king before they even get to his names. And of course, we know one of the titles they give him is Mighty God, El Gabor. In the very next chapter, in Isaiah 10, 21, it's the same address and title that's spoken of to the Lord. And they're calling this child El Gabor, Mighty God. Now, so wait a minute. So this king, so why didn't he just come from heaven in the glory uh, the glory of his father? And why didn't he come in like a chariot of fire? Because he sent one to Elijah to bring him back to heaven or bring him to heaven. So why didn't he come in one of those? Why didn't he come in without 100 million angels plus Daniel 7.10? No, he had to fill, fulfill two other offices before he could fulfill his total kingship. One of them? was the prophet, Deuteronomy 18, 15. He, Jesus had to do this role, this office first, before the kingship office was fully executed. And what was that? He came, I must preach in all the cities, as that's why I came. No man spoke like this man. And what did they say? Why didn't you arrest him? No man spoke like this man. And then it says that they, people were amazed at his teaching because why? He spoke with authority and not like their scribes and Pharisees. So Jesus fulfilled the prophet mantle and then... He had one more role to fill before coming back as the exalted king. Kids, Jesus, when he was in heaven before he came to earth, he could not come straight from heaven as the eternal word, the eternal son of God, equal to the Holy Spirit and equal to the Father in essence and glory. He could not come and just come and save us. He didn't have something. He had to have something or he could not save us. Does anyone know what it is? Kids, what didn't Jesus have before he became a man that he had to have to save his people? Blood, blood, 
Blood. But wait a minute, he's omnipotent, Michael. He says the word, he created the universe by the word of his power. Blood. He had another office to fulfill. He's both the high priest and the sacrifice. You see, before, he was already a king beloved before he came to earth, just by the right of being God. He created all things by the word of his power, Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, John 1. Everything was created by him and for him. So he was just king by divine right. But that's not the kingship we're talking about here. He came for this, get this conferred kingship, but he first had to fulfill the other two offices first. So what happened? How did this happen? How in the world did God become a child? That angel who appeared to Daniel who came, he appeared to Mary and he said, when she said, how can this be? I've never known a man. What did he say? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So that that thing which is born in you will be called Holy, the Son of God. He had to come as first like this, beloved. And you know what? Because he was, because he was God in flesh. And I say this with all reverence. This kid was nuclear. This is my nuclear reactor. And this child was nuclear because he was more than a child. He was divine. And then what does it say? Because that, it says that, you know, in the Carmen Christi, which is Philippians chapter 2, one of the most important passages that is worth memorizing. But it says, remember, it says that he didn't consider equality to get with God something to hold on to. Countless teachers in the body of Christ today say that Jesus emptied himself of his deity. Impossible! If he did, he was never God in the first place. Deity cannot change. It's called immutability. And Jesus did not empty himself of a drop of, a, of divinity. He emptied himself by taking on another nature, ours, without sin. So what happened? It says, because he humbled himself and he was made in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. Now, this might... Like this might jar you a little bit, but you know the name that Jesus got after his, his glorification and his passion and his ascension was not Jesus. He already had that; it was given to him at birth. If you look at the text carefully that Paul is quoting in Philippians, it's Isaiah chapter 45, and the Lord is saying, "I swear by myself that every knee will bow to me, and they will say that I am the Lord." So the name that Jesus got by going through his passion was not Jesus. He already had it. Now this God-man, because of what he did, he has a lordship conferred on him. Well, Michael, was he already the Lord? Yes, he was. That was his inherent lordship. But now because of what he did, the coming king. Now he, and this says in, in Acts chapter 2, what did Peter say? This Jesus whom you crucified, God the Father has made both Lord and Christ. All power and authority, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, has been given unto me. We don't need to wait for the second coming, beloved, for Jesus to have his power and authority. He has it all. Well, didn't he already have it before he became an M? He did. But remember, he was coming down to earth, humbling himself. And as a God-man, now he has been conferred on him a kingdom, Luke 22. And he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, then the last text. <laughs> Revelation 19, this is the Apostle John. I saw heaven open, and here came a white horse. The one riding it was called Faithful and True. And with justice he judges and goes to war. His eyes are like a fiery flame, and there are many diadems. I don't see my crown. Jesus has so many diadems. It's even a, it's a royal crown. It's something that's even more glorious than the Stephanos, the laurel, the wreath that athletes would win. Diadems. And it says there were many on his head. Many diadems. He earned them. And it's associated with kingship. And he had a name written that no one knows except himself. He is dressed in clothing, dipped in blood. What does that mean? In order for him to be the one who tramples his enemies in the winepress of the wrath of God, Isaiah 63, he first had to have his own garments stained with his own blood to make him worthy to do that. I saw his robe dipped in blood. This is the coming king. 
He stomps the winepress of the furious wrath of God, the all-powerful. He has a name written on his clothing and on his thigh. King of kings and Lord of lords. That's who's in here. If he's not your king tonight, make him your king, beloved. Make him your king. Make him your king. These prophets were pinpoint accuracy to the most minute detail. And everything they prophesied centuries before came true. Now the prophet of prophets, the Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet of prophets, the prophet, he said he was coming back in glory. How much more is his word secure that you know it's going to happen? So, Father, I ask you to do now what only your spirit can do, Lord. Come on, anyone, Lord, in the room, in your gentle, piercing conviction, Jesus, your Holy Spirit's power, and draw them, dear Father, to Jesus Christ, the King. In your name, Jesus, and for your glory alone. Amen. All hail King Jesus, all hail Emmanuel.